Hey there, and welcome back to RimWorld. My name is Pete, and today we complete episode 15 of our RimWorld series in the Cold Bog with the Cult of Jinx. In the last episode, we completed a few adventures with our small party of Maniac, Took, and Muffalo Shadow Mage, and while the three of them are making their way back to the village of Liviana, we are slowly but steadily running into a small food crisis. Now, I kind of foresaw that, and I think we'll be fine, especially now that we have some berry maker dryads, but still, a roaming grizzly bear is just too good to pass up. One shot to the brain and the animal goes down, and with that, meat will be back on the menu shortly. We are also investing some resources into the continued fortification of our base, this time with a wall to the northwest. Our entire eastern flank has already been walled off, and now we want to do the same over here. With the bear butchered up, Coco can now also prepare us some proper meals again, while Jekna now has enough bear skin to start working on the next leather armor. That is, if she doesn't succumb to hypothermia beforehand, yes, we might have pushed her a bit too hard during the day, but the outside temperatures are also pretty relentless right now. Still, after a few moments in her warm chambers, she is ready to go again. Luckily, she also did not suffer any frostbite wounds, and so, just as an eclipse sets in and shrouds the swamp in darkness, Jackna goes to work. The rest of the evening remains fairly uneventful, and so we can jump over to Redini and Thoraya, who on the next morning improve our northern wall a bit. After all, just because the area is closed off does not mean that enemies will never try to break through, so a few sandbags will hopefully give us a better defensive position. Eventually, we will likely also mine out that small mountain on the right, just so that our enemies don't have any cover to hide behind. The next drop of berries then goes straight to our very hungry muffalos, and in the afternoon, our small caravan finally returns home. And just as Muffalo Shadow Mage comes back, his partner Tina gives birth to another small calf. This time, we are going with the name Redaya, as always, picked randomly from the list of patron supporters in the naming rights tier and above. That now brings our group up to 5, 4 in the pen here, plus Shadow Mage, so in a few weeks we will probably be swimming in Muffalo wool, not to mention that Muffalos make for great caravan animals. At this point, I think it is now also time to continue researching, and we are indeed looking into great bows next. We have a few of very good quality already, but so far we are relying on our enemies to supply us with them, and with Jackna becoming more and more skilled in her crafting abilities, I believe we will be better off making them ourselves. In the early evening then, a tribal war merchant arrives with their caravan, and this could be very interesting, not only because Thoraya currently has a trade inspiration, but also because we can see two bears and a megasloth in the caravan, which are very likely for sale. Before we begin trading, however, let us first unload our own caravan. After all, we brought back 18 units of Luciferium, which alone might be enough to finance one of those animals. Eventually then, we are sending Thoraya out to strike a deal, her inspiration gives her the best trade prices of everyone in the colony right now, and first of all, we can sell a bunch of stuff here. Some excess medicine, the luciferium, some old weapons, and some clothing items that we're never going to use, all in all, about 1300 silver worth of items. Now, my first impulse was to grab the mega sloth, but the animal is already 20 years old, and that is also the life expectancy for a mega sloth in this game. So instead, since we have enough silver, let us grab both grizzly bears, and hope that they make lots of little bear babies for us, so that our tree-loving murder cult will one day be accompanied by a horde of bloodthirsty bears. Now, of course, the two bears need names as well, and for the female here, the name Vladamia was randomly chosen. Her mate, meanwhile, will from now on go by the name of Dr. Thunder, and if that isn't foreshadowing a great bloodline, then I don't know what is. The two of them will now move into our old starter base on the side of the mountain here, and for the first few days they should also have enough food, as we still have a good number of corpses scattered around the base. So no more dumping bodies in the river, from now on they will feed our army of bears. And they will actually do so for quite some time, as bears have a super low hunger rate of only 0.56, less than that of a small husky. 
So they should be quite happy in here for the foreseeable future, I think. And with that, we can jump ahead to the following morning. Coco's animal handling skill of 11 gets some much needed experience now, as she attempts to train both bears to haul for us. With a carrying capacity of 161 kilos, they are definitely well suited for that task, although they are also not the easiest animals to train. In any case, it's a good thing that we haven't made Coco our plant specialist yet, otherwise she would not be able to take care of this now. Jackna, meanwhile, finishes a bearskin leather armor that she will now put on herself. Next to all the crafting work, we should not forget that she is one of our best archers, and until now, her temperature resistance also left something to be desired. And speaking of archery, our four best shooters Spex, Maniac, Took and Jackna are now going out on a hunting trip, as a sizable group of boar has wandered in, and that means our food worries should soon be a thing of the past. Together, the four of them quickly decimate the pack, and so, as the sun slowly sets across the cold bog, we continue to honor the memory of Fatty McCool and carry a bunch of dead boar back to the village. A few hours later, Redini then kills a rat just as it self-tames, but we simply can't have anyone nibble on our precious meat right now. The next morning then begins with good news from the bears. Vladimir is already pregnant, so it seems like our two animal companions are getting comfortable in their new home. Maniac, meanwhile, tirelessly defends his butchering station against the critters of the swamp, not without making some sacrifices himself, but luckily, a few scratches from a rat are nothing that our Dr. Redini cannot heal. And so our shelves slowly fill themselves with fresh cooked meals from Took the Cook, while Maniac, Spex and Jackna take their next trip out into the swamp, this time to hunt a polar bear. In doing so, Maniac also improves his shooting skill to level 15, and I have to admit, it is a welcome change to finally have some wildlife to shoot in this series, and it fits nicely with our whole tribal setup. One advantage of that entire tribal situation is then the fact that events like this solar flare are basically a non-issue for us. We don't have any electronic devices right now, and probably won't have for quite some time to come, so this does not concern us in the slightest. In the evening then, Thoraya is on food defending duty, but I'm not complaining. It is a very easy way to obtain some extra meat, and with her thrombohorn, the risk of not killing the rats in one hit and allowing them to fight back is minimal. We also learn that Muffalotina is pregnant yet again, and I'm honestly not entirely sure for how long we want to have her push out babies, but worst case scenario, we can always sell or butcher them. Our northern wall, meanwhile, is taking shape. We are now in the process of extending it all the way to the water, and we're adding some sandbags as well, while Redini's construction skill is ever improving. In the middle of the night, Maniac also experiences a go frenzy, so for the next 8 days he will move considerably faster, receiving a bonus of 40% to his normal movement speed. As he's then hunting another hungry rat on the next morning, we have a squirrel self-taming on the other side of the map, so we'll send it straight to our home area, where we can then kill it much more conveniently. As soon as the entire colony is awake, Spex is also giving a leader speech inside of our common room. The quality of 71% here is the best we can do at the moment, and it should hopefully result in an encouraging speech, or at least not in an entirely terrible one. Her social skill of 6 is definitely also one of the limiting factors here, but we can't improve that without practice, and this speech here is an easy way to get some. A few sneaky animals are using this moment to steal some food from us, but we will turn them into more meat very soon anyway. Much more importantly, however, Spex's speech did in fact end up encouraging, so the entire colony, except for Spex herself, now receives a small plus 5 mood bonus, and we also earn ourselves an ideology development point. Up next, we are now blocking off the small northern path in the water here with a bridge, on which we can then construct some wooden walls. Admittedly, that's not terribly sturdy, but it will hopefully keep out most raiders and wild animals. The rest of the day is then spent butchering, cooking and researching, while Spex and Maniac are also putting in some good meditation hours at the Anima Tree, 
And we can also see that Coco's training efforts are coming along nicely. Vladimir here is almost ready to be put on guard duty, while Dr. Thunder seems to be a slightly faster learner as he is ready to move on to hauling training. And so, another night sets in, and while we watch Thoraya stay up late for some construction work, we are also informed that spring has arrived, and so we should hopefully soon get rid of the snow and the freezing cold temperatures. Until that happens though, we are particularly fond of quests that do not rely on traveling large distances on foot, such as this one here that we received in the last episode. By accepting it, an Imperial shuttle will soon arrive to pick up four of our colonists, who are then brought to another ancient complex that holds more info about the Horn of Edmo. And after the events so far, it should not surprise that we are taking Spex, Maniac, Took and Jekna for this quest. I am not entirely sure what awaits us, but sending out our combat specialist seems like a sensible idea, even though it does of course leave Liviana somewhat unprotected. So as the shuttle takes off, let's hope that we can complete this quest quickly. It does take place quite some distance away, but the mission site itself does not look like it will keep us busy for too long. The ancient structure is this comparatively small building in the middle here, which we are this time entering through the front door. That reveals a large room with the first terminal to hack, and as we head deeper inside, we quickly discover the second one as well, and also a room with a hermetic crate and an unstable fuel cell, so we'll stay away from this one for now. Instead, we can already put Maniac on hacking duty and continue to open a few more doors, quickly leading to the discovery of the third and final terminal, right next to a comms console, and we also have another room with a crate and a fuel cell below. Just as Spex then opens up the door into the next room with another crate, Jackna starts hacking the second terminal, and for some reason that triggers the fuel cell in the adjacent room. So things might get a little heated in a moment, but luckily the last room here has just another crate in it, so we can easily walk through and dig our way to the outside just as the fuel cell explodes. While Spex now deconstructs a piece of wall to equalize the temperatures inside and outside the burning room, Took is looking through the crates and it seems like we have stumbled upon an ancient stash of chem fuel, not really something we need at the moment, but perhaps our colonists can sell it to someone more interested. Now, despite parts of the structure on fire, I think we have done enough to contain both the flames and the temperatures, so Spex can now go to work on the third terminal, while Took already opens up the room with the other fuel node, just to be safe. Back in Liviana, meanwhile, our small bridge into the deep water has been finished, and because enemies cannot traverse that deep water, building a wooden wall on top of the bridge will now completely close off this area. Over in the ruins, Maniac finishes hacking his terminal, and unfortunately, because some of the walls here are made from steel, the fire is slowly spreading beyond just the one room. Still, for now it is easy to keep it in check, and so we are quickly done with terminal number 2 as well. Shortly after then, Spex hacks number 3, and with that we now have all that we need. However, we are of course not leaving just yet, instead we can quickly also hack the console here to trigger a supply satellite, and a few moments later we receive a lovely drop of 198 units of plain leather. And while Spex, Took and Jackna already leave the structure, Maniac should now hopefully be quick enough to open the last crate, grab the Luciferium inside and get out of dodge, and well, it looks like he just barely made it out in time. By the way, there is also an ancient enemy terminal that we could use to call in a small raid, but I don't think we need to do that. Instead, we can now dig our way into that no longer burning room, grab some silver from the thankfully fireproof crate, and with that, our small adventure here is almost complete. I say almost because we have an interesting assortment of animals on the map, starting with three rhinos. Rhinoceros leather is actually one of the most protective natural materials in the game, and since our shuttle allows us to take some stuff back home with us, let's finish off our small quest here with some hunting. A mega sloth is also roaming around nearby, so let's take care of that next, 
At this point, with four archers and some psychic abilities, no animal in the game really stands a chance, especially not after moving much slower once those first shots connect. And so the Mega Sloth, and with that a nice pile of heavy fur, quickly go down, leaving us with two more rhinos. Yes, that shuttle can carry a lot of weight. And yes, it can actually carry even more than three rhinos and a Mega Sloth, so for good measure, let's grab some wolf skin as well, and then we are finally ready to leave. Unlike in the last episode, we are not butchering any of the animals here, as we have much more suitable equipment for that back home, so we are just stuffing all of those corpses into the shuttle, and I can only imagine how our adventuring party must feel on the ride home. The loot from the ancient complex does of course also come with us, but compared to those animals, it is barely worth mentioning. A short while later then, everyone safely lands back home in Liviana and we can start hauling animals and loot back into the village. This will make for some lovely leather armors, I think, or perhaps even for something heavier. I will have to look into that. For today though, I think we have reached a good point to make the cuts. Yes, the episode ended up a little shorter than usual, but I'm also pre-producing another one right after this so that you have something to watch while I'm on holiday next week. It's a bit unfortunate that I had COVID earlier this month and that I'm now also away for a week. It's definitely not helping me make more videos. But again, I'll try to have another episode ready before I leave, so that at least this series can continue on its usual weekly schedule. So until then, I hope you enjoyed today's episode, and if you did, then I would be very happy if you could leave a thumbs up. If you like what I'm doing and want to support me and my channel further, then you can go ahead and subscribe to stay up to date, grab some merch over on shop.petecomplete.com or check out and maybe even pledge to the Pete Complete Patreon. Thank you all for watching and I'll see you next time. Cheers.